All right, so in this lecture, we're going to go through the vessels of the thorax, so the arteries, the veins, and then the lymphatic vessels as well. So here, here we'll start with the arteries. All right, so to start us off, we'll talk about the internal thoracic artery, which is also known as the internal mammary artery, which is it's labeled here. It arises off the subclavian artery, which you can see the subclavian here, and then it gives rise to internal thoracic. And it descends on just lateral to the sternum on the inner surface of the rib cage. So if we draw the sternum like this, and this is we're going to look at the inner surface, and you have the ribs coming out like this, and then the ribs coming out like this. It, the internal thoracic, there's two, there's one on each side. It's going to travel down, kind of on the, on the lateral inner surface of the rib cage, okay, or on the, of the sternum, okay. So it's internally here. And it gives rise to the two anterior intercostal arteries in each of the upper six intercostal spaces. So intercostal spaces one through six, it's going to give rise to two intercostal arteries, OK? Then it, when it gets down here to the, to the sixth intercostal space, or in here, it, it splits. And that's where it terminates. It splits into the musculophrenic artery, which is shown here, traveling over here. And then it has the superior epigastric artery, which is shown here, traveling here into the abdomen. It also gives off these branches as well, the mediastinal, the thymic, the sternal, and the perforating branches. The only ones labeled here are the perforating branches. You can see these here. Pericardiophrenic artery branches off as well, and it travels with the phrenic nerve. This is actually, if you're taking a cadaver-based course, this is actually important because you have the phrenic nerve which travels here, so we'll label that PN, and then you have this pericardiophrenic artery that travels just with it. So sometimes professors will like to tag that artery because it's traveling with the nerve. Important thing to know about the internal thoracic artery is clinically is it's used by cardiac surgeons and coronary artery bypass. The reason why is that this is artery, it's right there just anterior to the heart. And since it's an artery, it has a longer standing patency than the tra traditional saphous vein graft. So what that means is, is since it's an artery and it has this thick, you know, tunica media or tu uh, muscular wall within the wall of the artery, it can withstand the higher pressure uh, that it comes with arterial blood flow versus a vein, which is much thinner and can't, over time, can't sustain the high pressure and high demand of arterial flow. And so cardiac surgeons prefer to use this for especially the left anterior descending artery, which is we'll talk about in the coronary vessels lecture is the main supply to the anterior surface of the heart. The, this artery is nicknamed the Widowmaker because a blockage in this artery can be very devastating, can often uh, result in death. The LAD is running on this anterior surface of the heart. It's very surgically, it's very easy to take the internal thoracic off and then you can just connect it directly onto the LAD just distal of the blockage. So that's an important clinical tie-in. So the intercostal arteries, the upper six, as we mentioned, upper six anterior, they are supplied by the internal thoracic artery. The remaining are supplied by terminal branches of the internal thoracic artery. So that internal thoracic comes down and it splits into these two arteries, and these are what provide the you know six through twelve inter intercostal arteries on the anterior side. And then the inter anterior intercostal arteries they pass in the intercostal space within the costal groove of the ribs with the intercostal nerves, intercostal vein. And then they inform anastomosis with the posterior intercostal arteries, which are these guys shown here. The first and second posterior intercostal arteries, they arrive from the supreme intercostal artery, which is a branch off that costocervical trunk coming off the subclavian. But otherwise, the lower nine of the 11 total posterior intercostal arteries, they arise from the thoracic aorta. And you can see those coming off here. These are all your posterior intercostal arteries coming off the thoracic aorta. Now we'll talk about the veins. So the subclavian vein, you can see it on this side and on this side here. The subclavian vein is, you know, formed from the axillary vein, which was formed from the brachial vein, so it's draining the upper extremity and shoulder region, and it comes in here and it joins the internal jugular vein to form the brachiocephalic vein, and then the two brachiocephalic veins join to form the superior vena cava. So the subclavian vein, it's a common site for central line placement because it's just right here in an easy to access space just, uh, just below the clavicle. And then it's also important because a central line is often used for, you know, infusing such as like antibiotics or other drugs. So it gives it direct access to the, it's very close to the heart so that it doesn't have to travel too far. And then it goes into the heart and gets pumped out to the circulation. So the subclavian vein, it's, you know, clav like clavicle and then sub below. So just deep to the clavicle 
and superficial to the subclavian artery. So you can see the subclavian artery here, which is deep to the vein. Placement of the, of the central line it involves kind of finding a spot one to two centimeters below the clavicle where it has that change in curvature at the junction of the proximal one-third and distal two-thirds, so kind of in this region here. And then you go one to two centimeters below, and then you're, if you go deep to that through the skin, you're going to hit the subclavian. Complications is, is you can puncture the artery, the subclavian artery, which would be significant because you'd have a significant amount of bleeding. You don't want to do that. You could have, since the lungs are, are coming up in this region, you could, have, you could develop a pneumothorax if you damage the pleura. You could give them infection because anytime you're introducing something from the outside world into the body, you're putting the patient at risk for infection. And then you could also degenerate by, you know, sticking a needle into the vessel, you could generate a thrombosis. So the azygous vein, you've heard me talk about this and mention it before, so here we're going to talk about what it actually is. So it's formed in the abdomen by the ascending lumbar veins. So if we show that right here, here's the, the azygous vein formed in the abdomen. And then as you can see, it's ascending up this way and into the thorax and it joins the subcostal veins at the T12 vertebral level. So it ascends through the abdomen, and then it passes through the aortic hiatus. So if you have the diaphragm like this, and you have this region here, here's the aorta coming up like this. So it, is, it travels through the same uh, opening in the diaphragm as the aorta, and it goes through there with the hymeozygous vein and the thoracic duct, which then enable all these structures to pass into the thorax from the abdomen. Within the thorax, as you can see in the diagram here, it extends, it travels along these uh, the anterior surface of these vertebral bodies in the thorax, and by doing that, it's traveling in the posterior mediastinum. So this is a posterior view. You can see the esophagus traveling posterior to the trachea, which is here. So if we go down here, here's your azygous vein label for you. Here's the azygous vein traveling up in the posterior mediastinal area. It ascends up here, and then it arches over the right main bronchus. So if you can see here, it's kind of cut away, but here's the trachea. You can see the rings. And then it kind of by the bifurcation haps, happens here. So this would be the left. Here's the right. So the right main bronchus branches out over here. It's cut away in the diagram. So this esophagus vein it travels up in the posterior mediastinum and then it arches over the right main bronchus and then it goes to join the the SVC or the superior vena cava. You've heard me talk about the esophagus vein. Here's the esophagus venous system. So the venous system is formed by when you have the hemiesophagus vein the accessory hemiozygous vein, and then the left superior intercostal veins, all of them join with the azygous vein to form this uh, system. And so the purpose of this system is to provide collateral venous drainage to ensure venous return happens to the heart in the event of an SVC or an IVC obstruction, more so an IVC obstruction because these veins are helping drain the abdomen. So if you have a, a blockage here in the IVC, that's okay. The azygous veins can come up and then they join in the SVC and make sure that blood flow gets back to the heart. The hemiozygous vein, it begins at either the left ascending lumbar vein or at the renal vein. So this would be the renal vein right here or the lumbar vein traveling in here. So it would be this point right here. Here's the hemiozygous vein. And then it ascends superiorly through the abdomen. And then it passes through the aortic hiatus with the azygous vein, with the thoracic duct, and obviously the aorta. So here's the diaphragm, and then it ascends up here this way. Then within the thorax, it travels along the left anterior surface. So here's the right. This is your azygous. This is your left. So this is where your hemi is, okay, your hemiozygous. Travels up this left anterior surface of the vertebrae, and then it joins with the azygous vein, as you can see here, at the level of T9. Now, this is for the textbooks. This is for like a very specific anatomy exam question. In real life, this is very variable. So if you're dissecting in a cadaver, you know, you could go look at the T9 level. Don't be surprised if you don't see it joining there. You know, it could be a T10, it could be a T7. It's, you know, it's very variable. But for a textbook and for, you know, specific exams, I guess keep that T9 level in mind. And then on the left side, the 9th, 10th, and 11th posterior intercostal veins and the subcostal vein all drain into the hemiozygous vein. And you can see that here. So here's the, you know, the 9, the 10, the 11, and then here's the subcostal here, okay? And you can see them all coming out from the, their, you know, the intercostal groove and then tra in the costal groove and then joining with this hemiozygous vein, which then eventually comes up here and joins the azygous. There's also an accessory hemiozygous vein, and this is what is more up in this region up here, and it drains the 4th, 5th, 6th, and 7th intercostal veins, and it crosses at the T8 vertebral level, and then that's where it drains into either the azygous vein or the hemiozygous. So you have T9, T9 is here, 
that's where hemi drains and then you have t8 here which is where the accessory hemiozygous vein drains into the ozygous vein so a little bit about the intercostal veins here so the first posterior intercostal veins they drain into the brachiocephalic or the vertebral veins now what you have here is is you have a superior intercostal vein both on the on the right side and on the left side and so what you have here is you have these veins and on each side they'll drain the second and third posterior intercostal veins so on each side the second and third intercostal posterior intercostal veins they will drain into the right and left superior intercostal veins now the right superior intercostal vein it drains into the accessory hemiozygous or the ozygous vein on the right side so this vein here is going to go into either the accessory hemiozygous or just directly into the ozygous and then the left on the this left superior intercostal vein is going to drain just directly into the brachiocephalic vein remember with vein arteries are usually very consistent you, there can be some variability in the body veins there often can be a lot of variability and so that's something to keep in mind here so that's why we keep saying it can drain into this or that it's you know it's really just you know what's most common <clears throat> the remaining posterior intercostal veins they drain into either the ozygous vein on the right side and then on the left side they drain into the hemiozygous or the accessory hemiozygous vein on the left side all right, and to close this out, we're going to talk about the major lymphatic structures in the thorax. So the, really the main ones are the lymphatic ducts, and the ducts are the two major lymphatic vessels that are responsible for draining the lymphatic system into the venous system. So you have all these lymphatic vessels all throughout the body, and then they eventually all converge, converge onto the thoracic duct and the right lymphatic duct, which are these two ducts. You can see the right lymphatic duct here and then the thoracic duct here and they're responsible for returning the lymph to the systemic circulation by joining these veins here. So the thoracic duct, it's the largest lymphatic vessel and it's responsible for draining really the entire body below the diaphragm. So if you were to draw the diaphragm, so all of the abdomen, the pelvis, both lower extremities, and you can see the thoracic duct here, here it's forming in here and then it travels up like this. So this whole structure right here is the thoracic duct. And then so the entire body below the diaphragm, the left, and then the whole left side of the thorax, the left upper limb, and the left side of the head and the neck. So let's talk about here. It's shown here in this diagram in this, this like black line here. And it begins in the abdomen at the cisterna chile, which is this uh, black kind of circular junction or structure right here. And so that's where it forms. And that is the cisterna chile is actually formed by the right and left lumbar trunks and the intestinal trunk. So all these tr uh, lymphatic trunks in here that converge on the cisterna chile to, you know, bringing lymph drainage from all, all throughout the abdomen and then the lower extremities. They converge on the cisterna chile, and then you have the thoracic duct that emerges out, and then it travels up superiorly, and then it travels along the superior aspect of the vertebrae through the aortic hiatus. So if you have the diaphragm here, it travels through that aortic hiatus with the ozygous vein and at the T12 level. And it travels up on the anterior surface of the uh, vertebral bodies in the thorax. And it ascends between the thoracic aorta and the ozygous vein. And then it eventually goes through, and it travels, while it's doing that, it travels through the posterior and superior mediastinum. So here it's traveling in the posterior mediastinum. Then it makes its way up here into this, once you get past that level, the sternal angle, up into the superior mediastinum. And it travels between this, you know, thoracic aorta, which is coming down here, and the azygous vein, which is to the right of it or lateral to it here. So at this, you know, sternal angle level, which is about T4, T5, it actually turns at this level, and then it travels posterior to the left carotid artery and the left internal jugular vein. So you can actually see that up here, and it's labeled here thoracic, thoracic duct. It's traveling in here, and then it emerges out here. So then here, back to this diagram here, so you can see here's the cisterna chile, here's the, the thoracic duct ascending up, and you actually can get a good view of this in the cadaver if you dissect down carefully. And it comes up here, and then this is where it turns, and then as you can see, it joins the systemic circulation at the junction of the left subclavian, which is here, and then the left internal jugular vein. So the internal, when these two veins join, you also have the thoracic duct joining at this junction. And actually, if you're careful in this region, you can actually see this, um, this uh, structure here where it's joining. Now, an obstruction, so if you have an obstruction here or here, 
An obstruction at this point can actually lead to significant edema because you're blocking a major drainage route of all the lymph of a significant portion of the body. And so if you have a, you know, a malignancy or some other kind of structure, it's usually malignancy, especially in a test question, a board question, you can see a significant edema proximal to the area of the obstruction. A chylothorax, just so you know what this term means, what a chylothorax is is really kind of, it's almost like a pleural fusion of lymph fluid. So it results from a leakage of lymph fluid from the thoracic duct or potentially the tributaries of the thoracic duct. So you have buildup of lymphatic fluid. And a thing to, uh, to know here is, is that it's going to be kind of whitish or milky, and it's going to be thick. And that, that's uh, how you would know uh, like on a th when you do a thoracentesis and you draw this fluid back, this is, what, this is how this would be kind of described. It also is formed with uh, lipids. So if they look at the content of the fluid, it's going to be full of lipids as well. Because if you remember from physiology, lipids are actually absorbed through the lymphatic system, and then they join. They're not actually directly absorbed into the bloodstream in the GI tract. They're actually absorbed into the lymphatic system and then carried through the lymphatic system, and then they're they join the systemic circulation where the thoracic and right lymphatic ducts join. So you can have lipids found in here as well. So that's what can give you, clue you in on a thoracentesis to a chylothorax. So if it has a high lipid content and then if it's kind of this thick, whitish, milky uh, looking uh, substance. Now what causes these is direct laceration. So, you know, surgery in this area, trauma to this area, to the thoracic duct or its tributaries. Um, or you can have some non-traumatic causes as well. So you can have mal malignancy, especially lymphoma, can cause this. So the other major duct, the right lymphatic duct, found right here. The right lymphatic duct drains every area that's not drained by the thoracic duct. So if we draw a line down like this and then the diaphragm like this. So everything, everything down here below the diaphragm is thoracic duct. Everything here on the left side is thoracic duct. So it's really just the right side is the right. And that makes sense. It's right right, right, and right. So right thorax, right upper limb, right head and neck. These actually drain into the junction of the right subclavian vein and the internal jugular vein. So that, and you can see that here. Here's your subclavian, here's your IGV coming in here and it joins at that junction. Lymph node drainage, just real quick. The lungs, they drain into the hilar lymph nodes predominantly. The trachea and the esophagus, they drain into the mediastinal lymph nodes. That makes sense, it's in the region. This is the most high yield is the breast and the upper limb. They drain into the axillary nodes, which you can see here, which is in the axilla, and the pectoral lymph nodes. And we'll get much more into lymphatic drainage of the breast in the breast lecture. All right, and that concludes our discussion of all the vessels involved in the thorax region.